So we stopped at the time convolution property in the previous class. So we, talk, we were talking about properties of Fourier transform, and the, the property that we looked at was time convolution property, which translated to multiplication in the frequency domain. We proved it, and we are going to later use it. And essentially, the, the last result that we talked about was that convolution in time domain translates to multiplication in frequency domain. So convolution and multiplication are your operations that are Fourier transform pairs. Next, we need, still need to talk about integration property. Why? Because we talked about the differentiation property. When, when can you take advantage of the differentiation property? Whenever your functions are quadratic, cubic, you differentiate them once, twice, and then you can bring them down to some standard uh, Fourier transform or Fourier series representations. And then, if it was Fourier series, you were able to track back by just dividing by jk omega naught, right? By just dividing by that factor. However, it's not going to be the same for Fourier transform. We are going to have to integrate back. Let's see how we do that. So the integration property of Fourier transform says, if you are integrating a signal in the time domain, which is indicated as this, if I'm integrating the signal in time domain, over here I'm representing the signal as a function of tau, and I'm integrating out tau. So I'm doing a running integration of x of tau. If I do that in the time domain, that corresponds to doing all of this in the frequency domain. What does all of this mean? Multiplying with all of this factor in the frequency domain. But obviously we are given what? We are given that x of t and x of omega are Fourier transform pairs. We are given that. If you are given that, then if you integrate your time domain function, then you multiply the Fourier transform of it by 1 over j omega plus pi delta omega. Let's talk about how do you prove this. The simplest way to prove this is by using the time domain convolution property, which we recently proved, which is if you convolve two signals in the time domain, you multiply their Fourier transforms in the frequency domain. So let's try to form the convolution of two time domain signals. What do you have? X and U. Zoom in. So if you're trying to convolve X and U, you can represent that in two ways. One, in time domain as a continuous time convolution, or in frequency domain as the Fourier transform of x of t and the Fourier transform of u of t. The Fourier transform of u of t we have already computed as a standard pair, uh, standard Fourier transform pair in the previous class. So we will use that result from earlier. But in the first option, I said you can represent this as a ta continuous time convolution. Integration x of tau u of t minus tau d tau. This is your continuous time convolution integral that you have seen before exam one. Now, because you have this u of t minus tau, you can update this upper limit to t because u of t minus tau will be one only when t is greater than tau. Yeah, so that, and at that time it is one. So you have one multiplied by that. So you are integrating from negative infinity to t, x of tau, d tau. All of this is what? All of this is matching this guy. You have convolved the signal in time domain in the frequency domain, that would be multiplication, right? So if you want to find the Fourier transform of x convolved with u, you're essentially finding out the Fourier transform of integration of x of tau d tau from negative infinity to tau, uh, sorry, t. Convolution in time domain, multiplication in frequency domain of what and what? x of omega, Fourier transform of x, and Fourier transform of u, unit step x of omega carries over, Fourier transform of unit step from our earlier result is this, one divided by j omega plus pi delta of omega, that will give you your integration property. Questions here? Using the time domain convolution property, we have proved integration property. Remember, whenever you're tweaking something in the time domain, you are messing something up in the frequency domain. Over here, when you integrate, you're multiplying by that factor in the frequency domain. All right, next, let us talk about a general idea. And the idea is related to response of LTI systems. Here, I'm separating 
things out in two domains. The top, the above the black line is time domain. Below that is your frequency domain. You have an input that goes into a system with the impulse response h of t, and there is an output y of t. And obviously, this is a continuous time case, y of t can be computed by convolving input and the impulse response. We know this from earlier. And this is response to LTI system. So you can go with this idea of superposition, which leads into convolution. However, if you wanted to work in frequency domain, you could now take the Fourier transform of x, you get cap x of omega. Take the Fourier transform of impulse response, what do you get? h of omega. What is h of omega going to be called? It is going to be called the frequency response of your LTI system, right? So impulse response, take the Fourier transform, you got the frequency response. How does the system treat different frequencies? Is it a low pass filter? Is it a high pass filter? It's a frequency response of your system here. And on the output side, y of t in time domain, take the Fourier transform, you've got y of omega in the frequency domain. So when you're working in the time domain, you are convolving x with h to get the output y in time domain. However, if you want to work in frequency domain, which could be easier in some cases, then what are you doing? You're taking the Fourier transform of x to get x of omega, you're taking the Fourier transform of h to get the frequency response, convolving in time domain corresponds to multiplying in the frequency domain, so y of omega is simply the multiplication of x of omega and h of omega, and once you have y of omega, you can take the inverse Fourier transform to get to y of t. May be complicated, may be easy. All right, so you have those two options now to pick. You have to pick one, right? Do I want to work in time or do I want to work in the frequency domain? One might be easier than the other. So in, some, in most cases, you will have to sort of wait and judge before you start which method might be most straightforward and then pick that. Multiplication, until multiplication, you should be going okay. From multiplication to y, that inverse Fourier transform might be a little uh, tricky. But if you have some standard pairs, you might be able to do it very easily. Convolution over here generally will be a little bit more time consuming mathematically, right? Questions about this idea about how, response of LTI systems. How do you find y of t, the output of an LTI system, by working in time domain or an alternative approach to work in the frequency domain? Going once, twice, thrice. Next. Find y of t of an LTI system. You have given me an input. X of t is e to the minus a, uh, e to the minus t u of t, and the impulse response is e to the minus two t u of t, right? So how am I going to find the output y of t? Well, convolve e to the minus t with e to the minus two t u of t, you will get the answer. All right, that's one way. What is the other way? Let's work in the frequency domain. So if you work in the frequency domain, why did I choose to work in the frequency domain? I easily know the uh, Fourier transform of this. It's in the standard form. It is in the standard form. What is the form? the first Fourier transform that we looked at, e to the minus a t u of t with real part of a greater than zero. One divided by a plus g omega, right? So that was the first thing that we looked at. I know these two, both of these are in that form. I could find their Fourier transforms very quickly. I could multiply them. And then I will be able to do some partial fractions and then separate it out, take the inverse Fourier transform. Let's take a look at this. Fourier transform of x. Uh, so I'm referring to the example here. I'm going to just write it over there as uh, e minus a t u of t Fourier transform one divided by a plus j omega with a, a real part of a greater than zero. It doesn't converge when real part of a is um, less than zero. Next, so by using this over here, I have a as one, right? So the Fourier transform of e to the minus 1t u of t will be 1 divided by 1 plus j omega. Similarly, for the frequency response, I've got 1 divided by 2 plus j omega. You multiply them in the frequency domain, you're multiplying these two fractions. Multiply them, use partial fraction expansion. Uh, you're, we are going to have a lot of partial fractions like later on when we go to the Laplace discussion. But by using uh, partial fraction expansion, you can separate it out as 1 plus 1 divided by 1 plus j omega minus 1 divided by 2 plus j omega. 
you guys know the the idea, right? Like finding the residue, hiding one, finding the. All right. So we are we, we are going to have to deal with that uh, partial extraction expansion uh, again uh, over here as well. All the uh, there's an appendix one in the text which has a list of all those partial fraction expansion forms. Uh, and when we get to a place where we are going to need to refer to more and more of those forms, I will provide you with that reference. Right now, it was simple uh, finding the residue and putting them into two different fractions here. So I'm not citing them at this point. Now, um, I got y of omega. I need to find the inverse of that, right? So again, it is in standard form. It's in standard form. So I'll use the same Fourier transform to go back to y of t, which I'm doing over here. So the inverse Fourier transform of this is going to be simply e to the minus t u of t minus e to the minus 2t u of t. How, how is that? For this guy, the inverse Fourier transform will be e to the minus t u of t. For this guy, it will be e to the minus 2t u of t. This minus this. You got that. Questions? We found the response of a linear time invariant system to a exponentially decaying input by working in the frequency domain. Next, find the Fourier transform of a linear function. You see a line, you think what? Time differentiation property. You see a line, you think time differentiation property. It'll help you a lot. But you see this, some of you might say, I don't want to deal with time derivative property. I want to use the Fourier transform formula to get this. It is a straight line. How bad can it be? It will get messy very quickly. So, but there's a bigger problem. The bigger problem is, if you started to simplify things, this is a real and odd signal, right? So if you started to simplify things, suppose you had a real and even signal, your, your Fourier transform would also be need to real and even, right? So at that point, you will start sort of, uh, if you work with the Fourier transform formula, with the integration, it might not be straightforward. So it's better for you to use the time derivative property. So it is t between negative one and one, and it is zero otherwise in time domain. So in time domain, it looks like that. When you differentiate it by taking the derivative with respect to time, what do you have? You have a pulse between negative one and one, and you have two impulses that are pointing down, this guy and this guy, right? I know the Fourier transform of a pulse, and I know the Fourier transform of a, an impulse. So I should be able to use linearity and be able to find the Fourier transform of the derivative of x of t. So y of t is the derivative of x of t, which I have sketched over here. Once I sketch it, by the way, this is, this is increasing, and the slope is what? One, right? In one second, it has gone up one. In one second, it has gone up one. The slope is one, so which gives you the height here as one. And the weights of the impulses are what? Negative one and one. Ne negative one and negative one. Why is that? Going down by one. Going down by one. Negative one. Negative one. So y of t can be written as what? p of t is your pulse minus delta of t plus one. Where is that? Where is this guy? This guy is right here, right? An impulse that has been advanced. Where is this guy? This guy is right here. An impulse that has been delayed. Yeah? And then your p of t, of course, is p of t. Yeah? Now let's try to use the Fourier transform of p of t. We have seen this before. Negative one to one with a height of one. Two sync omega. What am I using? I'm using uh, negative t1, t1, 1 in time domain. The Fourier transform of this is what? 2t1 sync uh, omega t1. Again, standard result derived in previous uh, lecture, available in the Fourier transform pairs, tables. You need to refer to that during the exam time. Next, so 2t1 sync omega t1. In our example over here, t1 is simply 1. Right. So if you plug in t1 is 1, you get what? 2 sync t1. Uh, hold on. 2 sync omega, right here. 
T1 is 1. So you got the Fourier transform of this guy. How about the Fourier transform of this and this? Well, the Fourier transform of an impulse is 1. We derived that. Fourier transform of an impulse that has been delayed by one time unit is e to the negative j omega multiplied by 1. What am I using there? I am using the time shift property. Delay by 1, you multiply by e to the negative j omega 1. And because I am scaling the amplitude by negative sign, I am scaling the amplitude over here by negative sign. Similarly, if I advance it by 1, then I have a plus j omega instead. Both of these are using the time shift property of Fourier transform, which was derived in the previous lecture. And I think we also wrote down these identities also in the, uh, in the previous lecture. Now, so I've got everything, right? I've got P of omega, I've got for the impulse delayed, I've got for the impulse advanced. I just put all of these together to get the Fourier transform of Y of omega. Y of omega is P of omega minus one of the impulses delayed and the advanced. Okay, so this one is advanced, this one is delayed. Yeah? Next, I've got negative e to the j omega. Negative e to the minus j omega. Okay, so it looks like Euler is going to play a role here. Yeah? Let's do that. So p of omega, that was derived to be 2 sinc omega from earlier. That was the pulse, the standard result. And then if you combine this, you can bring out the minus here. You get what? e to the j omega minus e to the uh, plus minus j omega here. All of this is what? 2 times cosine omega using Euler's. So you've got the Fourier transform of what? The derivative of x of t. To go back, you would have to integrate. So x is what? x is integration of y. Integration is from negative infinity to t, y of tau, d tau. Which means what? If you are integrating a signal in time, you are multiplying y of omega with all of this. That's the integration property. So x of omega, the Fourier transform of the original signal is take y of omega, which we just derived, and multiply it with this factor. Yeah? So we are doing that over here. We are taking 1 divided by j omega multiplied by y of omega. You got this. Then you have pi delta of omega multiplied by y of omega. You got that. But because, focus on this, because delta of omega is valid only when omega is 0, you have to evaluate the Fourier transform of y at omega equals 0, right? Because that's the only time the delta is valid. So if you find out y of omega, what is it? 0 here, 0 here. What do you get? 2 sinc 0. What is that? 0, right? So 2 sinc 0 is 2. Minus 2 cosine 0 is 2. So it will cancel out and give you what? 0. So you've got 0 here. You guys see that? This will go to 0 because 2 sinc 0 minus 2 cosine 0 equals 0. 2 sinc 0 is 1. Uh, sorry, 2. Right? Sinc 0 is a 1. Uh, let's see. So all of this goes to 0, 1 divided by j omega, y of omega is written out over here. That's your result. Questions about this example? We use the time derivative property to find the Fourier transform of a linear function. Good. Uh, impulse train, train, uh, so, It's, it's not train, it's not periodic, it's just one. It's just one. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so, uh, so far, in terms of Fourier transforms, we have only dealt with aperiodic signals. We are going to find Fourier transforms of periodic signals as well, but we have not done that here. Good. Thank you so much. Uh, how did the multiplication sign become a negative? Ooh, where? Oh, so, right. So if you, you've got to do this, right? 
Yeah, partial fraction expansion, you guys know this. Yeah, find A and then find B, compare coefficients, da, 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 da. you get A to be one, B to be negative one, that's why you get this. So partial fraction expansion, go ahead. Not for this one, um, but Laplace, yes. Um, you are going to need them. But is that that? It's not that bad. Finding residues, right? Okay, you don't like it. All right, I'll uh, provide you guys with standard forms for the um, standard forms for the what? For the partial fraction expansion. Uh, so you will ha have the appropriate ref uh, reference to do it. FaceTime call? FaceTime call? Uh, that has happened to me a few times during lecture. My friend, my son's friend would call and they would spam call. And I, I'll be in a lecture and I'll be like, stop doing this. And then they are no longer friends now. So. Um, all right, so next property, frequency shift property. Uh, we talked about time shift. When you delay a signal in time domain, you are multiplying with a complex exponential in the frequency, right? Like that's a phase shift. But what if you shifted things in the frequency domain? So what would you do? So if you shift something in the frequency domain, think low pass filter being shifted to become a band pass filter, right? Think something like that. So if you do that, then what are you doing in the time domain? You are multiplying with e to the plus g omega naught t. The omega naught over here, the shifted amount in frequency that is being used over here, omega naught, also note that there is a plus. Typically, you see a minus, right, with the time shift. If this was a minus t, then you would see a minus sign over there. But there's a plus sign in the frequency shift property. You are given that the Fourier transform of x of t is x of omega. If you shifted in frequency, then you multiply with e to the plus j omega naught t in the time domain. Let's try to prove it quickly. The Fourier transform of e to the j omega naught t x of t is going to be what? Put it in the... Uh, Fourier transform integral, integration, negative infinity to infinity, the time domain signal, in this case, e to the j omega naught t, x of t, multiplied by e to the minus j omega naught, j omega t dt. You are integrating out t to be left with omega. Next, you have an exponential here, you have an exponential here, you can combine them as x of t remains as is, then you have e to the minus j omega minus omega naught t dt. What is this? This is like saying, Instead of omega, you now have omega minus omega naught. You, if you consider that as omega prime, a different frequency, this would be the Fourier transform of that. So this is x of omega minus omega naught. Let's try to find the inverse Fourier transform of 2 pi delta of omega minus omega naught. Where is this 2 pi delta of omega omega naught? Well, it's in frequency, right? So if you wanted to sketch it, what would it look like? It would look like, oh, come on, omega, and you're trying to sketch what? 2 pi delta of omega minus omega naught. 2 pi delta of omega minus omega naught. Where would this be? This guy would right be right here. The weight, 2 pi. The location, omega naught. Yeah? We are trying to find the uh, inverse Fourier transform of an impulse in frequency located at frequency omega naught with the uh, weight of 2 pi, which mean, means that if you integrate it over that, you would get 2 pi. So how do you find that out? Well, the inverse Fourier transform of 2 pi delta of omega is 1. We have, we have done this before in the previous lecture, right? What did we do? We said inverse Fourier transform of delta of omega is 1 divided by 2 pi. That's what we had de uh, de derived. But if you multiply 2 pi by both sides, you get this, right? 2 pi delta of omega is 1. So the inverse Fourier transform of shifted by using the frequency shift property is what? 1 
multiplied by e to the plus j omega naught t by using the frequency shift property. Find, find, so this is what we are doing. Start with the inverse Fourier transform of delta of omega. Then you multiply by 2 pi. Then you use the frequency shift property to find the inverse Fourier transform of 2 pi delta of omega minus omega naught. You get what? You get e to the plus j omega naught t. Let me quickly write down the things so that you guys can see this a little bit more clearly. So for one, what did you have? For one, you had uh, in the frequency domain for one, what did you have? Uh, two pi delta of omega, right? Yeah, uh, which means what? If you do a frequency shift, you multiply e j omega naught t two pi delta of omega minus omega naught. This was from earlier. This was. Uh, Oh, wow, it's been a while. All right, okay. All right, here. So the previous lecture. Next. Find the Fourier transform of a cosine signal. Cosine omega naught t. For cosine omega naught t, uh, I want you guys to almost be so comfortable with it that you almost memorize it. The Fourier transform of a cosine omega naught t. There's a reason for this. We use this. Fourier transform a lot, especially when talking about communication systems. Um, so let's see if we can uh, derive it first. For cosine omega naught t, using Euler's, I can express this as e to the plus g omega naught t plus e to the minus g omega naught t divided by 2. This cosine has one frequency. What is that? Omega naught is the radian frequency. Which means in the Fourier transform of cosine, you should see only one tone at plus omega naught, and you will see its mirror image at the minus omega naught frequency as well. So if you take the Fourier transform of, so here, earlier in the previous example, we said one Fourier transform was two pi delta of omega, right? And then we said, if I delayed this guy, two pi delta of omega minus omega naught, as per the previous example, the Fourier transform over here would be e to the plus g omega naught t. You guys agree with that? This is previous example. Or if I did this, if I had done plus here, I would have been doing minus here, right? You guys okay? So I need this piece here, and I need this piece here, and I also need to scale it by two. So in the frequency domain, I have what? From here, when I divide it by two, this two gets canceled. I'm left with pi delta of omega minus omega naught. And from here, the two gets canceled because of this guy, and I'm left with pi of del pi times delta of omega plus omega naught. So the Fourier transform of a cosine omega naught t signal is going to be two impulses, one at omega naught, one at negative omega naught, both of them with the weight associated with them. Questions about this? Cosine, Euler's, uh, and then we used all of these pairs, Fourier transform pairs. For impulse, frequency shift property, frequency shift the other way, and then use it, used it with the Euler's uh, representation of cosine signal. So in the time domain, if you have a cosine signal, with the frequency of omega naught, which means that its time period is two pi divided by omega naught. In frequency, it would look something like this. I've got uh, an impulse at omega naught with a weight of pi, an impulse at negative omega naught with an, a weight of pi as well. So let me just highlight this so that you have a mapping. This guy is mapped here, and this guy is mapped here. One is delayed, one is advanced. Both are same tones. One is uh, flipped out version of the other. Now, we just derived this guy, Fourier transform of a cosine signal. If you take out the factor of pi common, 
you have got an impulse at omega naught and an impulse at negative omega naught. But if you wanted to look at it in the sine, for sine omega naught, same process except you get, instead of getting two in the denominator, you will get 2j in the denominator and there will be a minus sign over here. That's the only difference. So you will get a minus sign over here and then you will have an extra j over there. That's the only difference. Still two impulses. So if you looked at the magnitude of the Fourier transform of a sign, it will look exactly the same as the magnitude of the cosine. Because the magnitude is still pi for this, still pi for this. But the phase will be different. Over here, the phase is what? 1 over j. What is 1 over j? It is negative j. Negative 90. Over here, what is it? Negative 1 over j. Negative 1 over j is what? j plus 90. So it will be negative 90 and plus 90 for that. Okay. That would be the, for the phase. Next, I want to start a new lecture now. Continuation of our Fourier transform property. Uh, before I do that, things going okay? Slow down, fasten up. Uh, is, this, is the pace of the lecture okay? Yeah? All right, let's talk about Fourier transform of periodic signals. We can take a Fourier transform of the periodic signal, right? Let's do that. Then let's talk about duality followed by time multiplication property and frequency shifting, symmetry properties, all of those will lead us into the first conversation about application of this class. Whatever we have learned so far, mainly with convolution, Fourier series and Fourier transform, we will apply that to communication systems. So that would be the first sort of application of signals and systems uh, conversation. So, let, after we finish all of this, we'll get into communication systems. That's my goal. Uh, so when we, for the exam, for exam two, when is exam two? Exam two is coming up soon. Uh, exam two is Monday, uh, what is that, July 26th? All right, so I am, going to have only one time slot. So if you are needing a second time slot, I don't want to make a completely new exam and arrange for uh, proctoring. That is becoming too much work. My intention with the second time slot was for people who are working. And it turns out that people who are working during the day are preferring time slot one anyway. Uh, so I'm going to just make time slot one as uh, the time slot for everyone. Unless you guys, uh, uh, so if if, they, if you are listening to this lecture after class or right now, and if you want uh, a different time, we can have a exam makeup time. Uh, we can think about alternates. Um, but we, we have fields exam. <laughs> yeah. All right. And if I say Thursday, you guys are going to say some other class has the same exam that day, right? Okay, no, see. <laughs> My own exam that day. Uh, Here, I, I got to pick a week. <laughs> uh, the week before that is not going to be good. That week, you're saying fields and waves and kinos. The week after that is too close to the finals week. I, 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 I know this is tough, but like, see, I, I'm in a tough spot here. Um, there's no good alter Wednesday. It will work for some, it will not work for the other. Here, I did an experiment three years ago with 20 students in a class in summer. They couldn't come to an agreement. 20 students. We have 70 right now. They, I guarantee you that there will be people who will say, I have got this planned, I have got that appointment, I have got, 
they will be something or, or the other. Uh, the only time that sort of I can expect uh, you to, to sort of follow is the class time. So time slot one it is. What is that? Take, take home test. You can take it after it's graded. Sure, you can take it. <laughs> All right, so exam one is going to be 26, only time slot one. Uh, I know it's 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 a uh, it's not ideal. I I I recognize that, but I'm not seeing an an alternative here. Um, let's see. All right, let's continue with our so time slot one. Everybody's on, going to be online. Exam logistics are going to work exactly like the 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 same as uh, the previous exam. Uh, proctoring will go on as usual. Uh, what else? It's just one time slot, one exam, so that I have to make only one exam and grade only one exam. Uh, let's see, what else? Oh, back exams. I will be posting back exams over the weekend for exam two, so that you guys can start your preparation there. The content of ex uh, exam two is going to be what? Wherever we stopped before exam one, all the way up to communication systems. So I want to have Fourier series, Fourier transform, uh, communication systems, and there was a little bit left before exam one, specifically with the with the step response um, and the initial conversation of Fourier series, which was breaking up a signal into an orthogonal set of functions with their projections. So a little bit of that will be will be there. So up until communication systems, we are going to have. After communication systems, that is after exam two, we will have what sampling. We will talk about sampling there. Questions, concerns? There's one resource that you will absolutely need for exam two. What is that? Fourier tables, series and Fourier transforms, right? So you absolutely should have that handy, print it out, look at it, know exactly where information is on those uh, sheets. All right, let's continue with Fourier transform. Fourier transform of a periodic signal. A periodic signal is one in which x of t equals x of t plus cap t, where cap t is the smallest time that satisfies this criteria, right? So the signal is periodic, x of t equals x of t plus cap t, and 2t and 3t and so on, of course. And we are trying to find the Fourier transform of that. So what am I going to do? I'm going to first consider x of t as a summation of its projections onto an orthogonal set of functions. So I have x of t, which is periodic, and I'm expressing that as an exponential Fourier series coefficients. Summation over all k, a k, e to the j k omega naught t. We have seen this before, where omega naught is what? 2 pi divided by t, t, cap t is your time period of the periodic signal, x of t. Then I'm also going to have these two Fourier transform pairs for reference. One, the constant signal in time domain has two pi delta of omega in the frequency domain. It has an impulse that is weight of two pi. Then if I use frequency shift property and I'm shifting it by k omega naught, some multiple of omega naught, then in the frequency domain, I, uh, in the time domain, I have what? One multiplied by e to the plus jk omega naught t. This is simply using the frequency shift property. So using the frequency shift property, we are able to write that. The Fourier transform pair here is e to the plus j k omega naught t in the frequency domain, you have two pi delta of omega minus k omega naught, where k is a scalar. Next, since a k, the Fourier series coefficients are a constant, we can use linearity property. Scalars getting multiplied, a k is a scalar, is a constant. So you can use um, linearity property. You multiply a k on this side, you multiply a k on this side. So you get that. Then you can sum it up for all k, right? So you can have, so once you multiply a k on both sides, you got this. Then you can add summation over here, you add summation over here because you can use superposition. So x of t that can be expressed as a summation of all their Fourier series coefficients with their orthogonal set of functions, the Fourier transform of that will be summation 
2 pi. Well, 2 pi can come out of the summation. You are left with ak delta of omega minus k omega naught. Essentially, if you want to find out the Fourier series coefficient, uh, uh, sorry, if you want to find out the Fourier transform of a periodic signal, what do you do? You find AK and substitute it over here and you're done. Right? All periodic signals obey the same, uh, obey the following general property. If X of T is periodic, then X of omega is made up of delta functions, the impulses. Where is this coming from? Now let us let me back up to that. Convolution in time domain corresponds to what? Multiplication in frequency? Okay. Sampling, right? So if you are making a, a signal periodic in one domain, you are sampling in your frequency domain. You are getting Fourier series, though that's why you have delta functions. And it would work the other way as well. If you made if you sampled in time domain, you would be making things periodic in the frequency domain applicable for sampling. Next, uh, let me find out the Fourier transform of a periodic pulse string. And because this is just simply a substitution of AK, I've already done that particular example. We can run through this very quickly. We have got this pulse strain over here, which is uh, one between negative one, negative T1 and T1. The time period of this signal is cap T. The Fourier series coefficients of this guy were derived and standardized as 2 T1 divided by T sync K omega naught T1 for all K. We have derived this earlier. We know it's a periodic signal, so the time domain signal, the Fourier transform of that is 2 pi summation over all K, AK delta of omega minus K omega naught. By the way, this result, you don't have to sort of worry about uh, remembering anything really. This result is, uh, right here in your Fourier transform pairs, right? Fourier transform tables, that result is there. You just need to know where you will be able to find all of these things to, to use them. So that's the Fourier transform of the periodic pulse strain. AK we have derived, so substitute it over there. Once you substitute over there, what do you get? You will simplify to four pi T1 divided by T, summation K equals negative infinity to infinity, sync k omega naught t1 from here and then you will have impulses at k omega naught as well so th so let's go back when you had a rectangle just one rectangle what did you have sync now you when you made this periodic what did you do you simply sampled the sync at one omega naught two omega naught three omega naught zero negative one omega naught negative two omega naught and so on so how does it look like oh by the way this is your dc term right when k is zero all of this will go to one, and all you will have just uh, four pi t one divided by t. That will be your DC term. When you sketch out, what do you have in frequency? You have a sync envelope because of which function? This function is making the envelope look like a sync, and then this guy is essentially sampling it. The sampling is happening where? K omega naught, one, two, three, four omega naught, right? Multiples of omega naught, right here. So sync envelope at omega equals zero, you got the DC term there, four pi T one divided by T. And then at omega naught, two omega naught, three omega naught, and so on, you have got your impulses. However, because it was a square pulse, we know that the second harmonic, all the even harmonics cancel out. So two omega naught, four, and so on were zeros. Questions here? Find AK, substitute, done. That's your Fourier transform, uh, the Fourier transform of periodic signals. Now in finding AK, you will need all your strategies for Fourier series coefficients that you had developed earlier. Time derivative property and whatnot. Next, there's a special case here. Let's try to talk about the Fourier transform of an impulse train. An impulse train is what? It's periodic delta function, right? Periodic impulse train, train of impulses, one after the other, this guy. Why is this useful? This is useful because this is what you will do to sample a signal. You will take a signal and you will multiply it with the impulse train. That's why we need to talk about impulse train. So what would be the Fourier transform of an impulse train? Impulse train is special to me because it is the only signal where 
the time domain signal and the frequency domain signal are the same. A Fourier transform of an impulse train is an impulse train. That's why it's special. So let's see if that is true or not. X of t is this, is an impulse train. The Fourier series coefficients of this impulse train are one over cap t for all k. We, have, we know that from before. If you substitute that in our formula here, what do you get? Two pi summation k equals negative infinity to infinity a k, which is one over t, delta of omega minus omega naught, which is impulses at k omega naught. So here, what do you got? You got the weights of the impulses to be two pi divided by t, but you have impulses at k omega naught. So when you sketch it out, you, you look at this. You have impulses with a weight of two pi divided by t. The impulses are present at zero, omega naught, two omega naught, and so on, as well as on the negative side. The Fourier transform of an impulse train is another impulse train. This is the only signal for which that is true. An impulse train is the only signal where the Fourier transform of a periodic signal is another periodic impulse train. Questions? Finding AK substituting. Fourier transform of, uh, oh, now let's see. Uh, maybe not, later. I'm detailing uh, a lot of the symmetry properties over here. Very good for reference. Can be proved. We will actually prove property number three in a little bit. Um, but they can be proved based on uh, some complex number identities and the formula for uh, Fourier transform. So in the left column over here, we have time domain. In the right column over here, we have things in the frequency domain. So let, if, I, if I zoom in over here, let's see. If in time domain your signal is even, then in the frequency domain, the signal will also be even. These are properties. Some of them, uh, sorry, we, we are going to prove one of them. The one that we are going to prove is property number three. If x of t is real, then x of omega has conjugate symmetry. We have seen this even, even in Fourier series, where x of omega equals x conjugate of negative omega. And you can say two things about conjugate symmetry. One for real part and imaginary part, and also for magnitude and phase. The real part of x of omega is even, imaginary part of x of omega is odd. We'll prove this. And for magnitude and phase, magnitude of x of omega is even, phase is odd. All of this you can say based on x of t being real. Again, these properties have been captured somewhere, right here. So you need to be able to refer to them uh, as needed. Uh, let me go here. Right. Uh, the last property, x of t is real. If x of t is real, you can also say that the Fourier transform of even part of x of t is just real part of x of omega. These properties can be proved by using the Fourier transform integral. Uh, what I'm going to do is let you guys have this reference and prove property number three, uh, specifically the, the one in 3a, 3, 3a. So if x of t is real, we can say that x is the same as x complex conjugate, but it's real. So the complex conjugate part is going to be the same as the real part, x of t. Given that x of t Fourier transform is x of omega, that Fourier transform can be written in Cartesian form or in polar form. In Cartesian form, it is going to be real part of omega plus j times imaginary part of omega. Next, if x of t equals x conjugate of t, then x of omega will equal x conjugate of minus omega from property three. That's the conjugate symmetry for Fourier series that we have proved. If x of omega equals x conjugate of minus omega, let's look at what is x uh, of omega. x of omega is this, right? What would be the conjugate of this? The conjugate of this will be r will be there. The imaginary part will become negative. So you've got r of omega minus j times i of omega. But we said x conjugate of negative omega equals x of omega. So if I wanted x of plus of x, so if I can do this, right? I can make this positive and make this negative. I can do that, yeah? 
let me do it in a different color so that you can see the, the change. Which means for x conjugate of omega, I can substitute x of minus omega that I substituted over here. x of minus omega is what? x of minus omega is minus minus r of minus omega plus j height of i of minus omega. Now you compare the real and imaginary parts. If you compare the real and imaginary parts, you can see that the real part is even, right? r of omega is r of minus omega. Real part is even and imaginary part is odd, right? The real part is even imaginary part is odd summarized over here so using such strategies and conjugate symmetry you can you can move through uh, a lot of those properties uh, symmetry properties Next, frequency um, and uh, frequency, uh, time and frequency scaling. Uh, this is mainly intuitive. If you have a signal, right? If you squeeze it, what are you doing when you squeeze it? If you have, so, say, a sine wave, you have squeezed it, increasing the frequency, right? So you have you have you have gone from slowly changing to changing it fast. So you have increased it. So as you are scaling in a signal in time you will be changing the, the frequency content. You will be moving it up if you squeeze it. If you expand it, what are you doing? You are moving it down in frequency, right? So if you expand the signal in time, you are making the signal lower and lower frequency. So that's what we are capturing over here. X of AT, you are scaling the time signal by A, and if you do that, you do the reverse scaling in frequency, but you will also have to include a scaling in the amplitude, one over absolute of A. That's how the math turns out with the one over uh, absolute of A. But this should be intuitive, right? This A and this A. If you are squeezing here, then you are sort of expanding in the frequency and, and vice versa. So let's try to prove this. The Fourier transform of X of T is what? This is our Fourier transform integral, negative infinity to infinity, X of T is the minus J omega T dt. That's your X of omega. For x of a t, we are simply going to have an a, additional a over here. Everything else is going to remain as is. Next, we are going to substitute a t equals tau. You do this change of variable, you adjust the limits of that integration, you compute the, so when t is negative infinity, tau will be negative infinity. Uh, when a is, as long as a is greater than zero. When t is greater than infinity, uh, when t is equal to plus infinity, your tau is going to be plus infinity. So we are going to adjust the x of a t becomes x of tau. We are going to change the limits, and we are going to say d t will become a d tau. Since we don't want a to change the sign on the, the limits on the integration, d tau. Uh, so instead of t, we are putting tau divided by a. Tau divided by a is going to be tau divided by absolute of a. Put this back into our Fourier transform. What do you have? One over absolute of a because of that guy. Integration remains as is. Limits are the same, x of tau instead of x of a t. And then in the exponent, what do you have? Earlier you had e to the minus j omega t. t is now tau divided by a. So you got what? E to the j omega tau divided by a. So d tau. All of this is like the Fourier transform of a signal x of tau, but the frequency now is omega divided by a. Right? So 1 over absolute of a carries over. This is Fourier transform of x with the new frequency variable omega divided by a. So that's your frequency. Uh, scaling, time scaling and frequency scaling property. Uh, and the uh, sort of the, the, the summary of that, a related remark is a fast changing signal in time means that the signal contains higher frequencies. And consequently, it will be represented by a wide frequency band. 
And on the other side, if the signal is slowly changing in time, then you have more low frequency components. So if you are squeezing in time, then you're expanding in frequency and vice versa. Next, concept of duality. This is important, can be confusing, um, because you are going to change functions uh, and swap that uh, T and the omega variables. So let's take a look. The concept of duality. Two signals are duals in the sense of Fourier and in Fourier transforms if the following is true. The Fourier transform pair is this, x of t and x of omega, right? So if you want to take the Fourier transform of x of t, you get x of omega. And if you take the inverse Fourier transform of x of omega, you get back x of t. If that is true, then you can talk about the dual of this Fourier transform pair, which is x, a, a, a function x, but in time domain, its Fourier transform will be 2 pi times small x, which is another function, but in frequency that has been flipped. So think about it like this. If you had a, let's say you had a rectangle here. For x of t, you had a rectangle, right? So x, small x represent a, represents a rectangle function. Then what does cap x indicate? A sink, right? The principle of duality, the, the concept of duality says, if you had a sink function here, but not in, but not in omega, in time, right? You had a sink function in time, then its Fourier transform will be what? Two pi rectangle that has been flipped in omega. Do I see that? So if you only had one, if you only talked about this, what do you know? You know that if you have rectangle here, then you have sync in frequency. And if you have sync in frequency, then you have sync rectangle in time, right? You know only to go one way or the other. But with concept of duality, you can say, what if you had that sync, not in frequency, but in time? If you had it in time, then you would have two pi delta rectangle of flipped in frequency. All of this, can be traced back to the formula for Fourier transforms and inverse Fourier transforms. Let's take a look. This, sim this property simply interchanges the roles of the function, small x and cap x. So this is one function here, x and x of omega, rectangle and sink, like you guys said. You put this function x over here, and then you put this small x over here, function. In time, you have a new function here, cap x. In frequency, you have a new function, small x, but with the flipped about the y-axis, and you scale it. That's, that's what uh, concept of duality lets you do. And the proof of that is this, because of the product. Duality works because of the product omega t in the integrals. So if x of t is what? x of t to find the inverse Fourier transform of a signal, you do x of t equals 1 divided by 2 pi, integration over all frequencies, cap x of omega e to the plus k omega t d omega. That is inverse Fourier transform of a signal. I can say this is f inverse x of omega, right? That's your inverse Fourier transform formula. The Fourier transform of x of t is what? This x of omega, you, you, you guys know this formula for Fourier transform already. What do you see that is common here? You see, between this integration and this integration, you have this 1 over 2 pi factor that's not there. The functions are being interchanged, and there is almost everything is the same, right? There is a negative in the omega that is different. There is a factor of 1 over 2 pi that is different, but everything else is the same. Can I see that? So, you could, you could do this. You could change the variable to, from t to omega. And you will, you will have, you can go from one uh, to the other. So for example, if you put like t and omega, if you interchange, what do you get? Small x of omega equals one two pi integration, right? Can you see that? 
if you just change t to omega and omega to t from here, you can go here. And what does this mean? This means that x of omega is the inverse Fourier transform of cap x of t, right? Uh, actually, no, it means that x of omega is the Fourier transform of cap x of t. But you have this extra 2 pi. So 2 pi, you bring it over here. All right, 2 pi, you bring it over here. All right, so that's one, yeah? All of this we can do it. And then instead of having it as minus a plus, it, you can have minus. Let's say minus here and then minus here. Yeah? Now look at it. The Fourier transform of cap x of t is 2 pi x of minus omega. That's exactly what we have here. Can you see that? So you just change, interchange the variables. You are back to this 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 form here, right? And you can do the same thing over here. You can say, all right, let's interchange x and omega, uh, t and omega. What do you get? You get cap x, t, negative infinity, infinity, small x, omega, e, j, omega, t, d, omega. Is that right? Take the, this is, this would be what? This would be inverse Fourier transform of small x is capital X. That would give us uh, small x. Okay, so this is taking us back to the, this, this itself, because you'll have to do the minus and then one over two pi to get back to the same, same conclusion. But with this, it was, it, it's very clear, right? It's very clear that the Fourier transform of cap x of t is 2 pi small x of minus omega. Questions about why duality will work? Interchanging t and omega should not change anything mathematically, right? Those are variables, independent variables. All right, so let's take, derive the, let's see, derive the equations. Okay, we did this already. Yeah, started with this, we substituted omega, then we did the negative, we did all of this. We, over here, we, we did, that's how we went from here to here. You don't need to do that again. All right, let's do some examples. Starting with the Fourier transform pair. I have a rectangle in the time domain. If I have a rectangle in the time domain, the Fourier transform of that is 2t1 sync omega t1. We have derived this, we have, we have talked about this many times. And you can express the time domain signal not just as a sketch, but also in a bracket notation over here. X of t is one between negative t1 and t1, and it is zero otherwise. The Fourier transform of that is going to be two t1 sync omega t1. Now, we are going to use duality to find the Fourier transform of a new signal, cap x of t, which is two t1 sync t t1. You see what we are doing here? We are replacing this guy with T. We are replacing this guy with T. We want to find out the Fourier transform of that signal. So what would that be? Well, from duality, the Fourier transform of X of T, if that is X of omega, then the Fourier transform of cap X of T is two pi X of small X of minus omega. That was the uh, duality, the concept of duality. X of T is an even function. Yes? So if x of t is an even function, then Fourier transform of cap x of t is two pi x of minus omega, and x of omega and x of minus omega are the same. So it's two pi x of omega, which is going to be what? Two pi between negative t1 and t1 and zero otherwise. All of this to say this, right? Like if the Fourier transform pair over here is okay, then the Fourier transform of this guy is going to be what? We need a factor of two pi, right? And then what do we need? We need a rectangle, right? Two pi times a rectangle that has been flipped, but it is an even function. So you, you flip it or you don't, it doesn't matter. That's what we are getting over here. But this is in time, so this is in frequency. You guys see that? No, you guys don't see that.
this is my small x. If this is small x, what is the Fourier transform of this? 2t1 sinc k, uh, not k, where did the k from? Sinc omega t1, yeah? That's the Fourier transform. This is what we are calling cap x of t, right? Uh, not a, oh, t, omega. What does the principle of duality say? Principle of duality says, if you had cap x of t, the Fourier transform of that guy will be 2 pi uh, small x of minus omega, right? So what is cap x of t? Well, 2t1 sinc t t1, right? The Fourier transform of this guy will be what? 2 pi cap x, small x of minus omega is going to be what? This is going to be in frequency, but it is going to be flipped. It's even, so it's the same. 2 pi multiplied by this guy, this will be frequency, but this will still be t1 and negative t1. And that 2 pi factor, you can just write it over here. This is what? This is uh, 2 pi small x minus omega, which is the Fourier transform of cap x of t. Yes? That is what we have captured here. So which gives us this identity at the end. If you have a sink in the time domain, then you have a rectangle in the frequency domain. The, uh, the weight of the sink, the height of the sink, at least at omega uh, t equals zero is 2t1. Over here, you have uh, two pi as the height of that rectangle. Uh, the only problem is this. Uh, I hope this is bothering you guys as well. My frequency axis over here is omega, right? But notice these bounds, t1 and negative t1, it doesn't, doesn't, uh, these are constants, so that, that's okay. But I would have liked to see maybe omega 1, omega 2, um, and it's even. So I would have probably liked to see negative w and plus w something that denotes frequency. Right now, t is not appropriate for frequency. So we, we will uh, try to change this to some w. If I want this to be w, cap w, what will I need to change? I need to change this, right? I need what, 2w think tw, right? Yeah? Oh. Uh, no, so instead of T1, I'm putting W, so that I have Ws over here. This T is the same. This is in time domain. So that is T, and this is omega. That, that, that's okay. Go ahead. No, 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 you can just leave it like that, but I'm trying to get it into like a standard form. Uh, I'll show you guys what I mean over here. So, right, so you see, if I put it in that Ws, I, I get like a Fourier transform that has Ws for the, the, the cutoffs, right? Like the low pass filter, say. You don't see cutoffs as T1 and T2s. You will see it as W1, W2, maybe, F1, F2, maybe, right? So you, we can do all of these over here. We started off with what we derived earlier using the concept of duality, sink in time, rectangle in frequency. Then we divide it through by 2 pi everywhere. So if you divide by 2 pi, you got a 2 pi division in here, and that became 2 pi to 1, right? You divided this by 2 pi, and you divided this by 2 pi, so that 2 pi became 1 there, yeah? Once you do divide it by 2 pi, instead of using plus and minus t1 for the limits, you will use plus and minus w for the limits. So if you do that, what do you have? 2 t1, so this 2, this 2 gets canceled. And Instead of T1, I'm using uh, T there, uh, W there, right? W there, W there. And then pi remains as is. So this is a function in time domain that has a sink envelope, but the amplitude of that sink is W by pi. The Fourier transform of this guy will be negative W to W with a height of one, a rectangle. 
which you can express that rectangle in the bracket notation this way between negative one and one. Sink in time rectangle in frequency. This is again we are we are going to use this later on as well. This is the transform pair 4.1 in the table. Questions about this? How do you use um, duality? So here you can you can actually grow the 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 Fourier transforms that you have seen so far, you can just expand them to a lot now. For example, you look at this, U of T, all of this, right? Now, now you can find out, so if you went here, what do you get? Uh, two pi U of minus omega, yeah? What would be the inverse Fourier transform of this guy? This would be one divided by J, uh, t plus pi delta of t. See that? Isn't isn't that uh, sort of you, a, a different approach, different way of looking at it? Now we have simply calculated the Fourier transform of this weird signal, right? And it turns out it is two pi omega of minus. So it is like this, right? Uh, 2 pi in frequency. You guys see the, the usefulness of concept of duality? Yeah? The, the problem is this. The problem is uh, it is difficult to identify that that particular uh, a, a, a Fourier trans, if you are asked to find out the Fourier trans, if I said, find the Fourier transform of one divided by JT plus pi delta T, uh, you guys would probably be in a little bit of confusion. Not because of pi delta T, pi delta T you guys will do it very quickly because it's simply pi, right? Uh, so that will not be the problem. The problem will be one divided by JT. One divided by JT, how are you going to find the Fourier transform? Okay, now you're going to try to attempt using, you know, uh, the, the you, you cannot dif even differentiate it, right? So you're going to try to use the Fourier transform formula. It's going to become messy. So it's not very easy to identify that you could use duality to solve a problem. So uh, generally for these kind of things, I give a hint, hint duality. And then you, you know that, okay, you're going to need some, some trick like that to do it. But with this, I hope that you see uh, that it can be used to expand the Fourier transform pairs to, to many, many properties, uh, to many, many Fourier transforms. Next, let's talk about this list of functions. On the left column, we have time domain. On the right column, you have the frequency domain. Some of these I've said like a few million times already, so you guys know this, and you've heard this from me many, many times. Like, for example, the first one, rectangle in time and frequency, in, it'll be a sink. And just now we saw that if it was a sink in time, it will be a rectangle in the frequency. Now, look at the third one. If you have a triangle signal in the time domain, my claim is that you have a sink squared in the frequency. Do you guys agree with that? Because the triangle you make by convolving two rectangles. The, the Fourier transform of rectangles are sinks. If you are doing a convolution in time, you are multiplying in frequency. You are multiplying two sinks that are the same. So you get a sink squared function. Next, you have a sink squared function in the time domain. If you have a sink squared function in the time domain, what did you do? You multiplied two sinks. If you multiply two sinks in the time domain, that means that you convolve two, two rectangles in the frequency domain. Right? Convolution of two rectangles that are exactly the same in the frequency domain will lead to a triangle in the frequency domain. Next, you have two different sinks in the time. Multiplication in time, convolution in frequency of what and what? Two different rectangles. Two different rectangles convolved in frequency gives you a trapezoid. Something like a uh, real, realistic low pass filter. Trapezoid in time will give you sink multiplied by another sink in the frequency. So at least with these signals, I'm not providing you know, all the details. I'm not providing the scaling. I've not provided the arguments. 
just the time and frequency. You, should, you guys should be able to see that association with the, uh, with the functions. Questions here on this slide? All of this is now like falling into place. All of the, yeah, more or less. All right, time domain multiplication property. So if you're multiplying two signals in the time domain, the claim is that you will convolve them in the frequency domain. However, we also have like a simple addition of this factor here. You will convolve, right? Multiplication will go to a convolution in frequency. However, you will have that additional one over two pi factor over there. Now let us try to prove this property. Uh, this property is much easier to prove if we start with the frequency domain. So if you start with the frequency domain, you have what? Some function in frequency, cap W of omega, is what we have at the result. One over two pi x1 of omega convolved with x2 of omega. Remember, we are convolving two signals in frequency domain, right? So it's a, still a continuous convolution, but instead of t's and tau's, we will have omegas and some other uh, variable, right? So we will use uh, theta, omega and theta over here instead of t and tau. So what can you, what can we say about the inverse Fourier transform, right? You see over here, W of t is inverse Fourier transform of cap W of omega we can use the inverse Fourier transform, the, the formula for that, one over two pi, integration over all omega, w of omega e to the plus j omega t d omega. We, have, we know this from before, convergence of Fourier series. Um, now, let's try to substitute. For w of omega, we substitute whatever we had earlier, convolution of two signals, we get that. All the other things remain as is. Next. We know how to convert two signals. X1 of uh, tau, X2 of omega minus tau. Right? X of tau multiplied by H of T minus tau D tau. Something like that. Instead of X and H, we have cap X1 and cap X2. Instead of omega, uh, sorry, instead of t and omega tau, we have omega and theta. So it's the formula for continuous convolution that we have used here to write the convolution out over here. And then the rest of the items are remaining the same. Next, change the order of integration. Instead of doing d tau first, then d omega, let's do d omega first, then d tau. So if you rearrange the, uh, uh, the order of integration, you can pull out this x1 of theta from here to here because you are integrating out omega first and x1 of theta doesn't have omega. You can pull it, pull it out. All of this is left over, right? From here and from x2 is left over. Now, if you observe this, what do you have? This is one over two pi integration of a frequency domain signal e to the j omega t d omega. This is simply the inverse Fourier transform of x2 of omega minus theta, right? This is, and this is a frequency shift. Frequency shift property says that this should be in time x2 of t e to the j theta t. Uh, no, this is uh, not inverse. This is Fourier transform of that. You guys have seen that? A signal, so first, do you, uh, do you recognize that this is uh, inverse Fourier transform equation? And when you do an inverse Fourier transform, what do you get? You get a time domain signal, right? That time domain signal is going to be for what? It is going to be for a signal in frequency that has been shifted. Which one? X2. So this should be the Fourier transform of X2 with the e to the j theta t, the shift, the frequency shift put it back in there. If you plug it in, uh, so we got that, x2 e to the j theta t. If you substitute it back and continue simplification, 
because you did that change of order of integration, now you are left with integration with respect to theta next. It will simplify out in such a way that it will be in this nice form, which is simply x1 of t. So the signal in time domain for w of t, which is the inverse Fourier, uh, inverse Fourier transform of cap w of omega, is simply the product of x1 and x2. So if you are multiplying two signals in the time domain, you're convolving them in the frequency, but you have an additional one over two pi factor. So that's the property over here. Let's apply this to an example. All right, so if you guys were sort of dozing off because the, oh, go ahead. Oh, you could, absolutely you could, yes. So we just did it one way. You could do duality. Uh, you will also have to use prop symmetry properties because you will have to deal with small x of minus omega, right? So you'll have to deal with some uh, symmetry properties along with duality. Uh, it's just easier to do it this way. Um, go for uh, the inverse Fourier transform of the convolution of the two signals. All right, so I recognize that the, the proofs can be a little bit boring. But hopefully when we start talking about examples, it gets a little bit more interesting. So let's do an ex example here. Uh, we have to find the Fourier transform of a signal x of t, which is the product of two sync functions. All right, what is the answer? Let's worry about the result. Uh, let's worry about the details later. Let's just estimate an answer. What is the estimation of your answer? Trapezoid. Right, you don't get a trapezoid. You know something you've messed up in the, somewhere, right? Okay, so at least half the points of the answer, question are already done. Like we are, we are, we are good, well on our way. Let's see. You have got uh, x of t as three pi divided by two, sinc pi over two, sinc three pi over two t. Right. I'll start with the first sinc. The first thing that I'll use is this, pi over 2t, because this guy is, so I'm, I'm isolating this sink and this sink. And the first sink that I'm using is with a certain amplitude. What is that amplitude? Pi over 2 divided by pi. Why is that? The reason is I had derived this particular Fourier transform pair earlier. And for this to work well, if you have a w here, you'd have a w divided by pi up front. So that is why I'm starting with that particular x1. Pi over two, because this is pi over two, divided by pi, because there was a divide by pi in the reference. For this particular signal, I know that the Fourier transform is going to be a height of one between negative cap w and w. In this case, negative pi over two to pi over two. That is in frequency. You guys okay with the first statement over here? Yeah? So why, so the, the confusion should be, generally is this, right? The confusion is generally, why did you use this particular amplitude scaling? And the reason for that is this guy. Yeah? Next, you can do the same thing for the second one, x2. Choose sync. 3 pi over 2 t. If this is 3 pi over 2, this should be 3 pi over 2, and there's a pi in the denominator. And if that is the case, the Fourier transform of this guy will be 1 from negative 3 pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2 using the standard result. The standard result is right here, which was derived uh, earlier in the lecture. So you've got x1 and you have got x2, but you see over here, when you multiply these two out, you don't get 3 pi over 2, you actually get something else, right? So you're going to have to do that late scaling later on. So let's say we are multiplying them in time. When you multiply them in time, what do you get? You get the first sink, the second sink, but only a half. Why do you get only a half? Well, you, your pi is cancelled out, you had a half there. Your pi is cancelled out, you had a half there, three there. Uh, hold up.
Oh, it's right here. The pi is cancelled out. You are left with half there and three, three, uh, three or two over there. And then the sinks are there, of course. Now you're you're multiplying in time, right? So when you multiply x1 and x2 in time, what do you have in the frequency? One over two pi, cap x1 of omega, cap x2. Oh, this is convolution of omega, right? Now let us try to put your convolution skills to test. I want to convolve those two rectangles. Let's worry about the one over two pi later, the, the amplitude scaling later. Uh, what is the shape of the output? Trapezoid. So uh, something like this, right? So let's try to work at identifying this point, this point, this point, and this point. Because that's it. Like once you identify those four points, you're done. The height will be later. One over, one over two pi, you have to scale it. So, go on. What would be that? Wait. The negative one. Let's do the simple ones first. So, if you add this guy and this guy, you get how much? Negative two pi right here. And then similarly, you can get plus two pi right here. Yeah? All right. For how long does it increase? The width of the smaller rectangle, right? So for pi. So that gives you, this should be negative pi, and this should be plus pi. Yeah? So right away, you've got that uh, on, the X, uh, on the omega axis. Now let's talk about the height. When you're trying to convolve this, what would be the maximum height of this? It will be completely inside the, the, the bigger one, right? So area of this guy, right? Area of this guy, multiple. So one times one times pi. Just pi. Is that right? That's okay. When I convolve these two, just x1 and x2, I got this, right? Did I want x1 convolved with x2? No, no, no. I didn't want x1 convolved with x2. I wanted half. So not half. Uh, 1 over 2 pi convolved with x1 and x2. So if I want to do 1 over 2 pi, what should I do with the height? 1 over 2 pi multiplied by pi from before. So just half, right? Yeah? Can I see it? Negative 2 pi, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. Yeah? So when you are convolved, Okay, so we have got the Fourier transform of the product of those two signals. Uh, right now, my scaling is what? Right now, my amplitude on the time domain is 3 divided by 4, right? But I wanted what? 3 pi divided by 2. Okay, so I need to divide by pi and multiply by 2. Sorry, 2 pi. I need to multiply by 2 pi. If I need to multiply by 2 pi on the left side, to get 3 pi divided by 4, uh, 3 pi divided by 2, then I need to multiply this guy by 2 pi. So uh, my earlier height was half, now it becomes pi. Questions about this example? A trapezoid, and it matches the trapezoid result that we had earlier. Questions about this example? Finding the Fourier transform of a signal that has two sinks. And now you can start, think, go ahead. Uh, but how are you going to know that, so, so here, one, how, so it's difficult to know that if you m multiply these two, you are going to get a number that's exactly two pi uh, away from. Now, you can generate so many questions on this, right? Like, you just go down this list. We, we dealt with what? We dealt with this. We just did this. You can, yeah, so you can have like so many uh, possibilities for questions here. 
All right, let's move on to uh, okay. So this is this is probably where um, I will stop with the frequency shift property that I'm revisiting. This will be quick this is because we, we are proving something that we have already proved, but we are proving it in the slightly different manner. The slightly different manner is time domain multiplication property. So remember we said if you shift a signal in frequency, you multiply with e to the j omega naught t in time domain. That was our frequency shift property. Now, can we prove this using the general, more general time domain multiplication property? Let us try to see. Because I've got a signal here, I've got a signal here, and I'm multiplying them. So I should be able to use time multiplication property to do this. So let's see. Uh, what would be the Fourier transform of x of t? Well, it will simply be x of omega. What will be the Fourier transform of e to the j omega naught t? Well, that will be 2 pi delta of omega minus omega naught. How do I know this? I know this from 1, 2 pi delta omega, and then what is that? e to the plus j omega naught t is 2 pi delta of omega minus omega naught, okay? So if I use that, multiplication of these two signals is the same as convolving these two signals, x omega with this, right? So tell me, where, uh, how does that look like? If you convolve x of omega with 2 pi delta of omega minus omega naught, isn't that just frequency shifting x of omega, right? Let's take a look. You're multiplying the two signals in time, which is this. In frequency, you're doing what? 1 over 2 pi, x1 convolved with x2. In our case, it is 1 over 2 pi, x is x, but our second signal is 2 pi delta of omega minus omega naught. You are convolving a signal with an impulse, the signal will move it towards the impulse. So the 2 pi factor will cancel out. You have x of omega minus omega naught. Right? So you get back the same thing. However, the new what is the new thing that we learned here? The new thing that we learned here is that if you are trying to convolve any signal with an impulse, the result is that signal moves there. It just moves to that particular frequency, which is going to be very useful when we start talking about this. So before I leave you today, I'll just talk about this very, very quickly. Cosine. Let's try to do this super fast. Cosine. What does it have? It has an impulse with a weight of pi at omega naught. This is omega. This is Fourier transform of a cosine. There's another impulse with a weight of pi at negative omega naught. We have proved this before, right? When you're trying to multiply m of t, a message signal, with a cosine, you're multiplying in time domain. This is a multiply, right? What are you doing in frequency? You're convolving them in the frequency. What are you convolving with what? The Fourier transform of the message with the Fourier transform of the cosine. So when you Convolve this guy with this guy, what do you get? You get something like this guy. Two triangles. Where are they centered? Omega naught, minus omega naught. What is the width? Well, this is W away from the center, right? So this will be W plus omega naught, and then W minus omega naught, and so on. What will be the height? Over here, you have got a one, here you have got a pi, but because you were convolving, were multiplying in time, you had a one over two pi factor in the frequency, uh, in the convolution, right? So one here, pi here, one over two pi there, so you're left with half. Any signal multiplied by a cosine, we have essentially done modulation, amplitude modulation. When you do the amplitude modulation, you take a baseband signal and you move it to the path band, move it up in the frequency domain. Half the energy goes at omega naught, half the energy goes at negative omega naught. Okay, I'm tempted to ask one more question. I, I modulated it by multiplying by a cosine, right? 
what do I need to do to demodulate it? What happens to this signal if I multiply it with another cosine? If I multiply this guy with a cosine, it moved up and down, right? If I multiply the multiplied signal, which is what, m of t multiplied by cosine with another cosine, the same cosine, cosine omega naught t, what is going to happen? This guy will move up to two omega naught and it will also move down to zero. This guy will move down to zero and it will go down to minus two omega naught. So you'll have one triangle here, two triangles that are right on top of each other at zero, which can be extracted using a low pass filter. That's how you detect a message. So you put it onto a carrier, send it at the receiver, low pass filter it, extract the message. That, that, that's where, where we are going with the, the community. This is going to lead us into communication systems that we will start in the next lecture. So we'll revisit this example. But I just wanted you guys to take some interesting ideas to think about for the next couple of days. All right, let me, uh, Bennett, you have a question. Yeah. This is omega naught, right? Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Okay, let's stop recording here. I will see you guys when? Today is Monday or Thursday?